Let's get right to it. Amoris Letitia is in the headlines again as two more prelates have signed on to the statement entitled Profession of Immutable Truths About Sacramental Marriage. The statement was released in response to the Vatican's official publication of Pope Francis's interpretation of Amoris Letitia that civilly remarried Catholics who are divorced can receive Holy Communion, in some cases, without an annulment. Latvian Cardinal Janus Pujats and Bishop Andreas Luan of Austria were the latest to add their names to the statement. Originally penned by three Kazakh bishops, the statement asserts that the Pope's commentary on his exhortation is alien to the Church's faith and tradition, that it's causing rampant confusion, and that it will spread a plague of divorce. There has been no response from the Vatican regarding that statement. However, Secretary of State Cardinal Pietro Parolin said this week that Amoris Letitia has emerged as a new paradigm that calls the faithful to a new spirit and approach. The Cardinal made his comment during a Vatican radio interview this week. Parolin acknowledged the difficulties arising from the document but said that is to be expected with any change. He was quick to note that the change in attitude is precisely the change that Pope Francis is asking of us. Parolin father further implied that the Holy Father is purposely and actively using Amoris Letitia as a vehicle to change the Church, adding that Francis is conducting this new paradigm wisely, prudently, and also patiently. Meanwhile, a recent Pope Francis appointee to the Pontifical Academy for Life is arguing that in the wake of Amoris Letitia, the use of artificial birth control is required in some cases. According to a report by LifeSite News, Italian moral theologian Father Mauricio Ciodi said in a recent lecture that, quote, when natural methods are impossible or unfeasible, other forms of responsibility need to be found. He continued, an artificial method for the regulation of births could be recognized as an act of responsibility, not in order to radically reject the gift of a child, but because in those situations, responsibility calls the couple and the family to other forms of welcome and hospitality. A new paradigm, indeed. Here to discuss, with analysis on these stories and much more, is canon lawyer, priest of the Archdiocese of New York and one-third of the papal posse, Father Gerald Murray. Thank you for joining us, Father. Uh, I want to start with this piece you wrote in the Catholic thing. It's received a lot of attention internationally, not all of it positive. We'll get to that in a moment. It's called The Crisis We Are Living. Now, what is this crisis and how important is it today in the life of the Church? The crisis centers around the Argentinian bishop's uh, interpretation of Amoris Laetitia, which is the papal document that's been at the center of this debate for almost two years now, and it has to do with the idea that people who are living in adulterous second unions, that is, they're not valid marriages, that they should be allowed to receive Holy Communion. Mm. And the crisis is prompted by the fact that the Argentinian bishops justify this as saying that in some cases it's infeasible for them to avoid committing adultery. And that introduces into Catholic theology a completely contradictory notion. It's completely alien to the faith that somebody could not or would be incapable of observing virtue and that if they're in incapable of refraining from adultery, they're not really guilty. So we kind of have here something very serious under the guise of pastoral charity, and that is the overthrow of the moral order. What is intrinsically evil, adultery mm. is intrinsically evil, can never be turned into something good by a claim that, well, people can't avoid that sin. That's the crisis. Uh, Father, you've heard the critiques, uh, some, and I'm not going to dignify all of them by, by reading their names and their publications, because some of these people have like five readers, but uh, they are calling you pharisaical. They're saying you're overly legalistic. You would say what? The charge of being a legalist is usually hurled out by someone who doesn't like the law that his opponent is defending. Uh, so if I'm defending the church's law about adultery, which is based on the Ten Commandments, the Sixth Commandment, thou shalt not commit adultery, very clear, 
That is a divine law, and I will defend it with all of the energy that the church has always defended that law. So to claim you're a legalist because you say don't commit adultery, that's just simply a debating tactic that really isn't effective. Mm -hmm. uh, Cardinal Coco Palmiero, uh, who's head of the legislative text office at the Vatican, came out last week and he essentially said, look, if you are, the, the sin lies in intention and will. So if it is my intention to stop sinning, but for whatever reason I can't, then that is an, a situation where that person could validly go to communion. I mean, that's what he put forward. Now, they were talking in this case about people who are living in an adulterous relationship, a second marriage or maybe some other kind of union, uh, while married or after being civilly divorced. Your thought on that, how valid is that idea? That's not a valid idea. It contradicts the catechism. I believe it's paragraph 1749 and following talks about the morality of human acts. And something that is intrinsically disordered or intrinsically evil can never become a good simply because of the assertion that what well, my intention is good. Mm. In other words, you can't say because I intend to do some good, I'm entitled to do an evil act. So because uh, I want to express love with my second wife, I therefore can commit adultery. Well, number one is she's not your wife, and adultery still is evil no matter what you intend. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think sometimes these people, and we're going to get into this, but they get wrapped up in these theoretical ideas of being merciful, but then they don't consider the ramifications of a real-world event. For instance, if I decide tomorrow, you know, uh, I, I meet a girl on the street, we fall in love, I decide to uh, move in with her, we have children, and I say, well, I can't leave this relationship because I love these children. The children would be scandalized if I just walked out. Well, that shows no regard to the first wife and the kids you left behind, right? Absolutely. In fact, that's the real world that we're living in here. Sin has social consequences, and mortal sin has very serious social consequences. The fact that you have, you know, some person may have done something wrong uh, does not entitle them to continue in that status of doing wrong because they don't want to make a change. They're afraid of what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. Well, look, that's the whole point of the Christian life. Conversion from sin will produce some anguish, but it will produce good. And by the way, you'll teach your, your partner and those illegitimate children that you have that you truly love them because you don't want to offend God anymore and you want them to honor God by not only, you know, supporting your effort to live a virtuous life and, you know, of course the church will say you have a natural responsibility to support financially any children you bring into mm -hmm. the world, but you have no right or obligation or possibility to say, I'm going to com continue to commit adultery because that's the way things should be. Mm -hmm. That is simply unchristian. Father, be careful of that use of the word you. I was just giving you a for instance. I don't have illegitimate children, so easy there. Uh, you write about the Argentine, <laughs> you right, write about right. the Argentine <laughs> bishops in your letter to Pope Francis um, and the Pope's subsequent endorsement of their interpretation of his teaching, Amoris Laetitia, as a contradiction of church teaching on marriage and communion. Do those documents, even Pope Francis' official endorsement of their position, raise this new understanding to a level of doctrine? No, it can't. Uh, Catholic doctrine about the uh, nature of marriage, the indissolubility of marriage, about the uh, intrinsic evil of adultery, that, that can change. What's happened here is that the Argentinian bishops have given interpretation of Amoris Laetitiae, which I believe, and so many others do, uh, that contradicts the clearly enunciated teaching of all the previous popes. Mm. And by speaking out, we're not attacking Pope Francis. We're simply saying, Pope Francis, we think that you made an error. We think that the reasoning given in Amoris Laetitiae is faulty. And we think that these bishops, by saying that it's sometimes infeasible for people to observe the Sixth Commandment, is teaching something that is contrary to the gospel and should be withdrawn. So the mm. effort here is not a personal attack on the Pope. The effort is to remind the Pope, we think, that he needs to look again at what his predecessors said and try and square that. Mm. And indeed, my hope and prayer is that Amoris Laetitia chapter 8 would be withdrawn because I think it's causing huge problems in the life of the church. Mm. Uh, Cardinal Secretary of State uh, Parolin, as you heard in our story earlier, is calling Amoris Laetitia a new paradigm in the church requiring a new spirit 
What is he saying there? <clears throat> I read those comments. I liked, I didn't get a chance to read the whole transcript of his Vatican radio interview. So I'll simply say, based on what I read, uh, a paradigm is basically a political so category a for like a government policy that we're going to look at things in a different way, you know, Richard Nixon's shift on China, uh, things of that sort. But in the Catholic Church, Catholic doctrine is not subject to paradigm shifts. Uh, Catholic doctrine is a treasure given by Christ and entrusted to the church to be promoted, defended, explained. So I, for me to say there's a paradigm shift here, it basically puts us into a category of a political way of looking at it and saying we need to take uh, what the Pope says and somehow would you know, forget part of what Pope John Paul II taught, if that's what he means, then I would have a serious objection. Mm -hmm. Father, I want to move on to some of the criticism. There are those, not only in the United States, some internationally, who are calling everyone out, even those of us just reporting on this, were being lumped in as dissenters by some. Now, I take that term very seriously, but we'll get to that in a moment. A particular uh, person of note that I had to bring up is Stephen Walford. He is a Brit, um, and he wrote a piece in La Stampa over the weekend. Now, I should say, I've done some research on Mr. Walford. Uh, near as I can tell, he is a piano teacher with no other credentials theologically or otherwise except for a papal visit with his family. Um, and yet he's been writing really the most hateful screeds against canon lawyers, bishops, cardinals, and even myself. Um, and I, I, I can't quite figure him out. But uh, he claims that you and others are misrepresenting Pope Francis's teaching. He says particularly, EWTN's The World Over says Francis is making a deliberate rupture from the past, that Raymond Arroyo and his show has a disgraceful attitude toward Francis. I don't really know what he's talking about because in this show, we've never disparaged the Pope in any way. We have reported on those questions surrounding Amoris Laetitia, which are widely questioned throughout the church, from diocese to diocese, sometimes bishop's conference to bishop's conference. Your take on this and your reaction to that piece, because they singled you out, which I'll get to in a moment. <clears throat> well, when you get into the public arena, some people are going to criticize you. Uh, what I look at is uh, the substance of what they say, and essentially he uses pejorative adjectives to put down people he disagrees with. Mm. And for me, that's not an argument. That's just uh, using slam words to try and make you be quiet. Mm -hmm. Now, as regards what does it mean to be loyal to the Pope and to be a dissenter, you know, we're all loyal to Catholic teaching. And Catholic teaching is not a mystery in the sense it's not unknown. It's been clearly explicated over the centuries. And on these questions regarding marriage, divorce, communion, uh, this has been treated extensively by the last two popes. It's in the Catechism of the Catholic Church. It's something that's well known. Just battles were fought over it. And when Pope Francis uh, decided to issue in Amoris Laetitiae uh, pastoral advice to priests, which was at variance with the previous practice, to recognize that is not an act of dissent or disloyalty. It's mm -hmm. actually just a use of intelligence and a desire to kind of reconcile what was said in the past with what's said now. So, you know, the Pope himself has said frequently that he doesn't like courtiers or yes men, that he wants gospel uh, frankness. Uh, he said that at the Synod, he wants right. people to speak their minds freely. Uh, he wants people to be in a, counter, a, a culture of encounter. Dialogue. So for me, in the life of the church and doctrinal questions, yeah, we don't, in a doctrinal question, when the Pope speaks, the world is not supposed to simply say nothing. We're supposed to say, Holy Father, can you explain to us how what you're saying now doesn't contradict what Pope John Paul II did, said? Because if you don't contradict him, we're all very happy. But if there is a contradiction, as so many people seem to think there is, and I'm one of them, uh, then we need to have a reckoning in the sense of saying, let's reconcile these teachings and make sure that the pastoral practice is not at variance with the doctrine. And that's, I'm afraid, I'm afraid we're going in the wrong direction here. Mm -hmm. And that's truly a source of sorrow. Well, I, I am very upset with the notion, and I think it is an ignorance. I'm going to write it off in mercy to ignorance. Uh, among some of the people I've been reading, because they don't seem to understand that this is not the Catholic Church, a political institution, where when you get a new pope, everything is, you, you suddenly change everything. No, no, no. 
It is built on a, a continuity, historical, theological, canon law. All of this builds one thing upon another and flows naturally from it. So you do have to square or reconcile what went before with what is being proposed today. And if there is a rupture, there is going to be reaction. That is normative. And when you're taking the words of Jesus Christ himself about adultery, it's hard to square and reconcile that with some of what we're hearing in the interpretation of the Pope's teaching. Not the Pope's teaching, but the interpretation of it. Now, I want to pull this out of Mr. Wolford's column from uh, La Stampa. And again, I don't quite know his qualifications, but I'm not going to get into that right now. And I'm not going to descend into pejoratives either, uh, though I have a few I could hurl, but I'm not going to do that. Um, he says here about you, Father Jerry. Father Gerald Murray, a canon lawyer from the Archdiocese of New York, stated on the 28th, 2017 edition of The World Over that adultery is always a mortal sin. We cannot go by moral theology, which minimizes the gravity of that offense. Father Murray either doesn't know what is taught in the Catechism, Veritita Splendor, and various documents of the CDF, or he is choosing to ignore them, creating a false magisterium that rejects the authentic magisterium in relation to moral theology. And he goes on. Your reaction, Father? Well, uh, Mr. Walford is profoundly mistaken. The Catechism of the Catholic Church teaches the exact thing that I just said, that adultery is a mortal sin and there are no exceptions. There are no categories of adultery that can be engaged in as acts of virtue. Uh, so he's wrong. Uh, this is part of the crisis in the church where people somehow think that based on Amoris Laetitiae and its subsequent uh, interpretation by different bishop conferences that suddenly Catholic teaching has changed and that adultery can be a good thing for some people. That's just plain wrong. I'm sorry that he's saying that uh, and basically I'd encourage him to go back and look precisely at the catechism and the teachings that he cites. John Paul II would be horrified if someone came along and said, you know, Holy Father, I read your documents and I think, gee, isn't it nice that some people can now call themselves Catholic and defend adultery in some cases? That's simply not, not possible. Mm -hmm. I want to move on. Uh, the, a, a group of Cossack bishops this past week, um, led by Bishop Athanasius Schneider, issued a document reaffirming their understanding of sacred marriage, holy matrimony, the implications of it, and uh, it seemed to be a critique or at least a um, stand against some of these interpretations in Amoris Laetitia or the subsequent uh, teachings we've been hearing. In it, um, or in an interview rather, uh, Bishop Schneider cautions against becoming victims of what he called an insane Pope centrism or a kind of popolatry. Popolatry. Um, strong words. Does he have a point? Well, I think he has a point because precisely these people are coming along and saying, forget everything that John Paul II or Benedict said as regards communion for divorce and remarried, only what Pope Francis says in AL and on Mors Laetitia counts. And the church has never said anything like that. Um, if the Pope intends through Amoris Laetitiae to change the Church's teaching on adultery, marriage, and communion, then that has to, has to be absolutely clear, and then we have to say to him, Holy Father, you've made a mistake. Mm. Now, the cardinals who asked the dubia precisely wanted to know if that was the Pope's intention. And I find it, you know, sad that the Pope has decided not to answer those dubia, at least publicly, he's never answered them to this point. I think the Pope's making a mistake there because those questions are posed out of goodwill and a desire to be not accusatory in the absence of full knowledge. They want to know, is this what you really mean, Holy Father? Mm -hmm. Now, by giving the Argentine bishops his uh, apostolic approval, uh, that seems to be answering the dubia. Right. And I'm, of course, saddened by that because, again, I think the Pope, Pope Francis has not explained how his teaching, uh, if that is the, what he really intends, that people who are committing adultery can receive communion, how that can be squared with previous teaching. Mm -hmm. So, without an, without yeah, the bishop in Kazakhstan, I think, are heroic in, yeah, yeah, without an annulment. And, in, yeah, an annulment is, is finding that there was no marriage in the first place. So mm -hmm. we're talking about those who are invalidly in second unions. But mm -hmm. well, the Kazakh bishops deserve praise, in my opinion, because they're raising this discussion precisely to the appropriate level, which is, 
what has Catholic doctrine always been? It needs to be defended, and if it's being misstated or misinterpreted, that needs to be rejected. This is in no way an attack on the person of the Pope. I see it uh, precisely as an act of loyalty to the Pope and to the See of Peter that we would say, Peter, uh, we need clarity here. Well, they, they say in the letter, they see it as part of their obligation as bishops to raise this question that they see as contradicting or perhaps confusing the magisterial teaching. So, look, that's their function. It's not a layman's function. It's the bishops at their proper level, and, and uh, they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. Now, we have long talked about Amoris Laetitia bleeding into other areas of Catholic thought, Catholic moral teaching, and indeed now it seems to be doing so. Italian moral theologian and new member of the Pontifical Academy for Life, Father Maurizio Cioldi, said earlier this week, and he cited specifically Amoris Laetitia, Chapter 8, that artificial birth control could be considered required in certain cases for morally responsible Catholic couples. What could he possibly have meant here, Father, particularly as we're about to celebrate the 50th anniversary of Humanae Vitae? Are they going to reopen Humanae Vitae in light of Amoris Laetitia? Yeah, Father Coyote has done a tremendous disservice to the Church and is really a disgraceful performance on his part in a lecture at a Catholic university to state that some couples should, as a matter of virtue, as a matter of doing what's right, uh, use artificial contraception. Artificial contraception is intrinsically evil. It's a, it's a moral disorder. It's a mortal sin. Uh, for a priest to be telling people to do that is encouraging them to commit sin. Um, now, I read uh, the account uh, on the website uh, regarding that speech, and I was scandalized. Uh, he precisely takes Morris Letizia, Chapter 8, as his launching pad to say that what was taught in the past no longer has relevancy given the changing circumstances. This is wrong. No priest can contradict Catholic teaching and thereby change it. Uh, Catholic teaching remains. What it does is it scandalizes the faithful, weakens the faith, and then it's an invitation to commit sin. Hmm. Uh, you know, your listeners, who are very astute people, should realize Pope Paul VI teaching cannot be undone by a priest sitting in a university giving a lecture. But many people will say, oh, I guess if the Catholic Church tolerates this now, that that's what we're supposed to do. Father Coyote's uh, speech should be rejected uh, by the Holy See uh, with great vehemence because it's undermining what Pope Francis called a heroic act by Paul VI in issuing Humanae Vitae. So very, very uh, sad, but unfortunately, as, as you pointed out, people were predicting that confusion over Divorce and remarriage would lead to confusion over other topics. Yeah, well, that's what I mean. When you, when you begin to pull out the thread of one piece of moral teaching, it does have consequences, even unforeseen ones. So I see this as a natural outgrowth. I mean, if you're going to say you can, you can be in an adulterous relationship and without annulment, without real con full contrition or public contrition, you can just go off and go to communion because you intend to end this relationship. At some point, you feel you're a good person and you're contributing to something good. Well, that seems just continuing your sin, right? It is. Look, you know, you, the, the ends don't justify the means. The circumstances don't change the morality of a human act. If something's immoral, if using artificial means to frustrate the natural purposes of the marital union, uh, if, if you can justify that, uh, then you basically say Catholic theology is dead. It has no mm. meaning or, anymore in the modern world. And I reject that completely. In fact, uh, Christ's mm. liberating truth never dies no matter who criticizes it. Mm. Father Jerry Murray, before I let you go, very quickly, uh, in Germany, a deputy chair of the German's bishop, German Bishops' Conference was quoted as calling for the blessing of some same-sex unions. He said, we need to think about how we evaluate a relationship between two same-sex people in different ways. Is not there so much that is positive, good, and right that can think about a blessing? Your thoughts on this? Well, Raymond, uh, what you said earlier is now extending to a third topic. Uh, we divorce and remarriage, uh, contraception now, homosexual activity. He wants us to bless sodomy. He wants the Catholic Church to say to two people who are sodomizing each other, you're doing something that is pleasing in the sight of God and we want God to bless, meaning we want God to favor this type of activity. This, and this is 
quite simply a statement of fact. This is a total rejection of Catholic doctrine on the Im immorality of homosexual activity. For this bishop to say that is a major scandal, uh, he should repent of it and turn away from it because he's leading people into sin. I do work with Courage from time to time, which is the apostolate that helps Catholics with same-sex attraction live virtuous lives. When they wake up and turn on their computer and read this kind of news, it's an insult to them. It's an insult to them to say, oh yeah, look, the bad behavior that we told you to stop, well, it's pretty good according to the German bishop. Mm. Ordinary people should not be subjected to bishops contradicting Catholic teaching. No, this is, if I seem angry, it's because I am. This is infuriating. A shepherd is sent out to lead the sheep to the pure waters of Catholic truth, and this man is saying immoral activity should be blessed. Uh, he needs to repent of that teaching. Father Jerry Murray, thank you for being here. I know you've got to run. Follow all of Father Gerald Murray's commentary, including his latest column, The Crisis We Are Living at the CatholicThing.org. I've also posted it on my Twitter feed.